three, two, one. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Robin Glant, and I'm a clinical manager for children and adult services here at Andrews Goggin Home Health Care and Hospice. Today's presentation is the last of a four part series and is titled Where Mental Health and Healthcare Intersect. Today's session will be recorded. We want to give a huge shout out to our donors that are making these presentations possible. Thank you to the 2022 Community Building Grant at Maine Community Foundation and Thomas N. and Elaine H. Hackett Family Fund at Maine Community Foundation. Here at Andrew Scoggin, we constantly talk about our why. We want to provide the highest quality of care to our patients and clients, and to do that, it needs to be culturally and linguistically inclusive and appropriate. We need to understand our workforce and volunteer populations in order to support them in being successful. We also want to create a safe and welcoming environment for all. Today we have four fantastic presenters, Tiffany Martinez and Edward Belanger from St. Mary's Behavioral Health ED, Ernestine Perrault from Tri-County Mental Health Services, and Scott Hutcherson from Lewiston Veterans Center. Today's objectives are to better understand how cultural culture and diversity can be the driver of mental health, better understand how mental health treatment is impacted by culture, better understand where and how mental health impacts overall health, and understand resources available to them in the communities they serve. So we have a Q&A box. Uh, we definitely welcome participation and any questions and feedback um, to our presenters today. Um, enter your questions in the Q&A box and we have a moderator behind the scenes who will um, help um, filter those questions through. Um, our first presenters um, are from St. Mary's Behavioral Health Emergency Department and please take it away. Thank you. I'd um, like to welcome everyone this afternoon. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So discussing how mental health crisis differs from behavioral health. Um, when we discussed this, we came to the determination that uh, a lot of it fell under the behavioral health umbrella. Um, and I had jotted down some notes in describing mental health. I we define it more as thoughts and feelings and what might be influencing them um, versus behavioral health, which are volitional habits, actions, and behavior people choose to take in response to scenarios. Um, as far as life stressors, um, I mean, th those are different for everybody. Um, when you're talking about culture, uh, I, those, those are driven by culture, life stressors, um, depending on whether it is uh, culture like ethnic culture or it could just be even um, economic culture those sorts of things um, as far as stress related physical symptoms um, things that you know we see that are stress related physical symptoms are like insomnia hypersomnia loss of appetite those sorts of things um, mental health crisis we'll talk a, a little bit more about in the next slide um, and substance abuse, but um, looking at health seeking behaviors, defining those more as uh, things that people try to do, behaviors that people try to engage in that promote their health, uh, exercise, diet, sleep routines, those sorts of things, um, but all under the umbrella of behavioral health. Uh, next slide, please. So, in doing our research and our discussions, um, Tiffany and I were were volunteered as the presenters. We we worked with two other people uh, to pull together everything, and and we had discussed a mental health crisis as any situation where a person's behavior puts them at risk of hurting themselves or somebody else, and or prevents them from being able to care for themselves or function effectively in the community. Um, that is is pretty clear and cut it's also the same criteria for when we see patients in the emergency room and maybe they need to be involuntarily committed 
somebody that is at a at a more imminent risk of hurting themselves or hurting somebody else or is disorganized that they can't meet their own uh, care needs, then um, they're in a mental health crisis. And, and what it, what needs to happen is intervention right away. Um, so the emergency room oftentimes is is where people uh, come to to have that intervention. Sometimes they access mobile crisis. Um, and there, I mean, other other interventions could be just accessing whatever natural supports they might have in place or even professional supports. Um, as far as the emergency room and what we do, um, I mean, it, it's used mainly as a, it's a, it's the place for the assessment. It's a place for stabilization. Um, and then in trying to figure out how we're going to do stabilization, we need to determine, um, you know, what needs to happen to reconstitute people into their baseline. Um, if we go back to thinking about mental health as being thoughts and feelings and what might be in influencing those oftentimes, um, if somebody has a history of a mental illness and they've chosen to not take their medications or those sorts of things. So a choice is something we said was a behavioral health issue, but it's affecting their mental health. Um, so there's a little intersection there. Um, and we, we actually see that often. Um, and so at that point, once we've determined that that's what's influencing the mental health crisis or whatever the thoughts or feelings are, um, then we can address that. And sometimes we see other things that come up are uh, substance induced psychosis that would be an effect on mental health. Um, so although behaviorally making the choice to use substances can affect your mental health, um, you know, and sometimes it's just um, it's it's your it's your chemistry. It could just it could be an initial uh, psychotic break for some folks. Um, and, you know, then then that sort of opens the field for uh, what do we need to what do we need to do to stabilize right now, which means make the person safe. Um, within the next 24 or 48 hours. And then when that's determined, um, trying to figure out um, is, are they safe enough to, to move on to that next level of care, um, which would be more of the community outpatient types of things. Uh, next slide. Ed, before you go on to the next slide, there's a question. Oh, and maybe let me hold the question. Maybe it's going to be assessed on this one, answered on this one. I'll, I'll hold it. OK, um, so as far as our role, uh, it's it's an access point, like it says um, during the mental health crisis. Uh, it definitely is a safe place for evaluation. And then our in our emergency room, we have psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners that complete the assessments. Um, sometimes we'll some get patients from the community that have already been um, interviewed or assessed by the mobile crisis team. Um, sometimes Tri-County uh, is the ACT team provider in this, in this region. We'll also collaborate with them and, and they'll be directed here um, just as because it's a safe place. Um, we also here in the BED at St. Mary's, we do uh, chemical dependency treatment. So people come here often for detox. We will assess, um, figure out what it is that the you know withdrawal is from. Um, sometimes that's alcohol, benzodiazepines. It could be uh, opiate withdrawal. Um, and again, it's the same sort of uh, it's the assessment and then trying to figure out, you know, what does the intervention need to be and what's the best level of care to to make that intervention. Um, oftentimes there's. Uh, you know, there's a disconnect between uh, what people feel they are supposed to get when they come to the emergency room um, and then what we are recommending. Um, of course, people are also um able to get second opinions and we definitely do collaborate amongst ourselves um but it everything really kind of stays in line with these things that i was saying falls under the the umbrella of behavioral health um 
it it does appear that there are as as St. Mary's goes um, in this area, we tend to also be the safety net for um, the disenfranchised, uh, low socioeconomic um, situations, people coming in that just have very limited resources or maybe have burned a lot of bridges in terms of um, just trying to access resources in the past with their um, behavior afterward. So that that sometimes is a barrier, but um, also, you know, what needs to get addressed. So trying to trying to brainstorm around those things. Um, could I get the next slide, please? So Ed, I will ask that the question. You mentioned mobile units or possibly referral partners like Tri-County Mental Health referring um, people to the BED uh, for care. If a patient is in mental health crisis and they arrive at St. Mary's Emergency Department, do they start in the emergency department and then are moved to the BED after assessment or whoever so is doing like... It yeah. depends on what the presentation is when people arrive. Um, so when a lot of times um, if the police are bringing, bringing us a patient um, and, and they've detained them or safety is a factor, the BED is a lock unit. Um, so if we think safety is an issue, um, then people will start out back here in the BED. But before we do any mental health assessment, um, they're seen by a physician, an attending physician and medically cleared. Um, that there's nothing medical causing the situation that is being presented. And then, then we'll start our behavioral health assessments and determination of um, disposition, level of care, what resources are necessary, those sorts of things. Does that answer your question? Great, yeah, thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, again, the, the role of culture and behavioral health um, in, in putting this together, um, the consideration of, of cultural factors in the assessment and treatment. So, um, you know, as we've talked about in for years, that we know that culture can affect the way individuals describe their symptoms. Um, and, and before I said culture can be a lot of things. So it's not necessarily, uh, it could be a family culture, it could be a, uh, a heritage culture. It could be um, just where people are from. Um, and we and we do try to take all of those things into consideration when making our assessment. Um, the second point, uh, patients talking about feeling dizzy or tired or cursed or cold. Those are all words that that people use to describe their symptoms. And sometimes those are very culturally driven. Um, you'll have, you know, people that come in and it could just be some in their local information from what what's gone on in their family because culture is the ways a population's passed on along generations. And is there generational poverty? Is there generational mental illness? Is there, um, you know, lack of access to resources and those sorts of things? Um, as far as uh, in Lewiston, of course, um, and the entire state, we see a lot of uh, immigrant refugee population patients coming from multiple countries. Um, we are fortunate enough to have a um, translator. We use everything. Um, you have interpreters do online, and we've been fortunate that sometimes they, they themselves can see the disconnect in the words being used or how a problem's being described um, because they, people sometimes refer to their symptoms as, as not the words that maybe we use as professionals, but it's our responsibility to try to glean it down to, to what is it that a person's trying to explain, what's going on with their mental illness, what's going on with their symptoms, um, and, and is, are there cultural things driving that? Are, some people don't want to be at the hospital um, in their culture. That's, you know, it's it's a bad thing to be at the hospital. It's a bad thing to ask for help. It's a bad thing to to talk about your trauma, um, which, you know, uh, Tiffany will talk about even later on. Um, you know, so one of the, and that's, that's the point of the bullet point on the end, the Western medically focused description of symptoms and conditions isn't, it's not universal and it's, 
it's just one way to express a person's experience as to what's going on. So a lot of times when NPs are doing their assessments or just as a treatment team, we're trying to figure out how to address problems and intervene. Um, we're taking into consideration some of these cultural things just automatically um, and problem solve. And there's a lot of a little sleuth uh, gumshoe work involved in trying to figure out people's situations. Uh, next slide, please. So before I turn this over to Tiffany, um, we put this quote in. Uh, Resma uh, Menachem is a uh, he's an author and is talks about uh, trauma and culture. And one of the things that um, was pointed in terms of this quote is just the decontextualization is that trauma in a person over the length of time without any context starts to look like a personality disorder. Um, trauma in a family that loses its context over time starts to look like family traits. Um, that's so that's not necessarily. It's not necessarily culture. It's just it's trying to be trauma informed to be able to address what's going on with people. Um, and then just in with people it's without any context, it looks like their culture. And that might not also be the case. So there's a little bit of intersection there. Um, and then Tiffany will take it over from here. Thank you, Ed. Can everybody hear me okay? OK, wonderful. Yeah. So my name is Tiffany Martinez. I'm one of the psychiatric nurse practitioners here at um, in the behavioral emergency department. Uh, my role here really is to uh, meet people when they're in crisis. And as Ed was saying, that looks different um, for everybody. But I, I do the consultations and try to come up uh, with dispositions. Um, could we switch to the next slide, please? So we're just going to shift over to this topic of intergenerational trauma. Um, I would imagine it's probably a term that many of you are already familiar with. Um, so I just wanted to touch base on that because I think it's important to have this information and you know, um, and how this kind of ties into this new study of um, epigenetics. So just reading from the slide here, um, this definition of intergenerational trauma being these are the descendants of those who have experienced trauma continue to show the same kind of emotional and behavioral reactions without actually experiencing the trauma themselves. So for example, they've done studies on um, individuals, so children of Holocaust survivors, for example. Um, I was looking up some studies and one of them from the American Journal of Psychiatry and 2014 had um, studied how the children of Holocaust survivors with PTSD had um, lower rates of methylation and that kind of goes into a little bit of the epigenetics but how you know the individual the children themselves even though they did not go through what their parents did that they still have the effects of that trauma onto them so hopefully I made that a little bit clear. So some of the reactions people could have could include shame, guilt, increased anxiety, depression, this sense of vulnerability and helplessness, low self-esteem, hypervigilance, intrusive thoughts, etc. Um, so the experience of repeated exposure to trauma changes the way the world is perceived and introduced to later generations. Um, so just kind of delving into it a little bit more, um, we sort of look at trauma being transmitted in, in different ways. And so, you know, we know that how um, a young person is raised, if they are um, the child of someone who's gone through something traumatic, um, will experience change through, you know, it could have been in utero through some DNA modifications, um, cultural patterns, which Ed kind of touched on a little bit, and then just the environment that they live in. You know, are they exposed to um, aggressions or microaggressions? Um, and so I kind of just wanted to bring up this um, 
this uh, topic of epigenetics very briefly and sort of just give a, a definition of it because it's a really interesting um, field that's newer, uh, but very important to understand this topic of intergenerational trauma. Um, so I'm just going to read the definition. It's the study of how your behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. So unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are reversible and do not change your DNA sequence, but they change how your body reads a DNA sequence. Um, so, you know, what we used to think was set in stone, like, one, you know, your genes, you can't fix them. We do now know that, you know, with certain um, positive changes, we could help reverse some of the effects of what that trauma um, does to a young person. Um, so I think that's all I really want to cover on this. Um, could we switch to the next slide, please? So kind of on the same topic, um, I think everyone at some point has heard of adverse childhood experiences. Um, so having been, it's a definition as stressful experiences occurring during childhood that directly impact a child or affect the family environment in which they live. So some of these examples could include, you know, a child being exposed to parents who are using substances, who have mental health problems, maybe they're in and out of jail, any kind of form of abuse, whether it's sexual, physical, emotional. Um, so we know now that, you know, the more uh, adverse childhood experiences a child has, the more likely they are to have um, a mental illness, um, a substance use disorder, and even a lot of physical health conditions such as asthma, heart disease, cancer. Um, and I just wanted to mention too that um, with the ACEs and associated social um, determinants of health that can cause this toxic stress, it will often affect the way the child's brain will develop. So in that turn, you know, will affect their attention, their decision making, their learning. So, you know, trauma really does affect um, a child in so many different ways. So um, just wanted to touch on that briefly. And then if we want to switch to the next slide, please. OK, and so this is just a slide that shows that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the more ACEs a person experiences, the greater the risk of later development of both mental illness and a chemical dependency. Um, it also can negatively impact their education, their job opportunities or earning potential. Um, so one of the facts around this being uh, females and several racial ethnic minority groups are usually at a higher risk of experiencing four or more of these ACEs. Um, and so, you know, what we're trying to look at is how can we prevent these sort of situations from happening? Um, and so one of the things that I found on the CDC is that, you know, preventing ACEs could reduce the number of adults with depression by as much as 44%. And that's a pretty significant number. And then if we want to just switch to the next side, slide, please. So just, you know, sending home the message that prevention really is the key here. That, you know, when people are able to meet their basic needs, when they have housing, when they have food security and health care, they will do much better if they have, um, you know, quality education, reliable child care. So, um, it, you know, it really takes, um, you know, a whole community to push for helping, you know, um, these families and children to, you know, have successful and, you know, safe lives. Um, so uh, I think really that's kind of touching. I think that's about it for what I wanted to talk about in regards to trauma, um, intergenerational trauma and ACEs. So. Thank you so well, much I've for got, listening. I've got a question and then we have a comment as well from, oh, go back. Uh, we've got a question and then a comment from someone. Um, one of the comments, and this is a really great point um, someone makes here. They say, I know some of our colleagues from the African immigrant community have asked us to use emotional support rather than mental health because the stigma around mental health. And I would guess that probably all our speakers would probably attest to that because you're all working with such diverse populations. But I thought I'd read that comment because I think that's really impactful. I think you'll find that um, 
the stigmas are different too. I mean, as culturally, culture to culture, I think there's stigmas around mental health in general, but I think this is a great way to address it um, by just changing your verbiage. And then I had another question. Um, you mentioned two slides back that women were more susceptible, especially those of a minority. Mm -hmm. When you think about increased susceptibility, is prevention and treatment, does it vary at all? Or is it the same across genders where the um, risk could, is greater for populations or? Could you, can you repeat that? I'm so sorry. Yep. Um, you were saying, I think two slides ago, you were talking about mm -hmm. for ACEs, women of minorities were at greater risk. And yep. I'm just wondering with greater risk, or for those minority populations that are at greater risk, is there different prevention or treatments due to their increased risk? Or is risk and prevention generally the same across all boards? Sure. Um, I think I'm understanding it correctly, but um, I guess I'm having a, sorry, I'm having a hard time understanding the question. I'm so sorry. I could just be. That's okay. We're just talking about when you think about ACEs, does uh, treatment or prevention methods or interventions, do they vary across cultures or is it kind of cookie cutter based on the diagnosis? Is that a better way to word it maybe? Yeah, so I mean, I think when it comes to treatment, um, you know, it's individualized. So, you know, I don't think there's different ways to go about it. I think it's just all individualized treatment and, and trying to get someone um, the, the uh, you know, resources that they need. Um, yeah, I guess maybe Ed has a little bit more to add to this. Your, your question brings to mind a patient that came in in full, she was fully catatonic but would not, and she was in postpartum, she was having some postpartum issues. And she was from, I can't remember what country she was from, but um, didn't, didn't speak any English and she would not let go of her baby. And so we knew culturally, like we, the, we just watched, we didn't feel like the baby was at any risk of harm. We knew that she wasn't operating at baseline and we monitored really closely, but we did really take into consideration um, the cultural stuff that she had going on. We didn't want to take the baby away from her directly. We needed to make sure that she understood all the things that we were trying to tell her before we intervened. So she, so there was no misunderstanding that we were taking her baby away permanently or that she was, you know, because we had to have police here and, and, and in her country that that was a real, that was a bad thing. So she, you know, there were a lot of things. So, so I think that the prevention is, is individualized and it is it isn't cookie cutter i think that you know we we try to take into consideration all the cultural things we can when we come to the wall sometimes um as long as we're upfront and honest and say this is this is what we typically do to intervene in x y or z um and sometimes that then then choices need to be made and and sometimes a cultural broker in that situation or a family member um that that can be really helpful because you know it's it's hard to understand everybody's cultural stuff 100 percent of the time in you know every situation it, it actually also brings to mind we had another gentleman that was from another country um that the police brought to us he'd been walking barefoot and had made it, I think, from Waterville to Lewiston. Um, and the police picked him up and he didn't speak any English and we were trying to medicate him. He was dead. There was definitely a psychiatric emergency. And when we eventually were able to, to reach his family and have them help us intervene and communicate with him, then he started to get better because he, he realized that we weren't just locking him away. Does that those answer the question? Yeah, that, those are great examples. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Ed and Tiffany. I think what you're talking about with the cultural competence is incredibly important, and it sounds like your methodology can be really impactful for the people that you see in your ED, so thank you for that. Our next presenter is Ernestine Perrault, and she is from Tri-County Mental Health Services. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I've been asked to speak, obviously, about um, substance use, um, and uh, it's a it's hard to um, to put that into context for 15 minutes. <laughs> this it's uh, we all know the uh, the complexities of substance use, and um, I think I I wanted to actually start with. Um, with the resources, because um, if there's any one question that I get asked on a regular basis is where can someone get help? Um, what does that look like? What programs are available? And um, and uh, I'm I'm very glad that uh, St. Mary's obviously is uh, um, represented here today because um, we're in a, a great partnership with them of helping um, you know this particular population and between what they have to offer on the inpatient side. Uh, as well as what we can offer um, either before or after treatment um, in the hospital. Um, it's it's a really, it's a great mix to be able to help people um, uh, across the state, but predominantly in, in our in our county. Um, so if you don't mind, I think I have three slides that are just about um, the resources that are really um, special to Andrews Garden County. So if you don't mind, um, giving me the first slide, that would be great. So Ernestine, Ernestine when you I think I only have one question. slide from you. Oh, OK, maybe they're all together then. <laughs> so, all right. So Ernestine, 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 when you sent those, I thought you said they were handouts. So I have them all and we'll be emailing them to all the participants. I apologize okay. for that misunderstanding. No, no worries. Yeah, so it's all good. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so I'll just kind of go over those a little bit. We. Um, there, uh, a lot of folks are familiar with a program called Options, and um, and it is statewide. Uh, it isn't just special to Andrews Garden County. Um, I'd like to think that we, you know, we do a, a a very good job of being able to respond uh, alongside emergency medical services and law enforcement agencies uh, in order to provide short-term clinical interventions, uh, uh, reach at-risk communities. We de help to de-escalate behavioral health crises, uh, engage in post-overdose follow-ups, provide naloxone leave behind kits oftentimes with folks, and help families and individuals with referrals to treatment. Um, it's uh, options has really become uh, a literal, um, you know, kind of lifesaver to be working alongside uh, Lewiston. Um, Police departments and Andrews Garden, uh, well, actually, all of the uh, police departments in Andrews Garden County, uh, we have a representative, a liaison that goes out amongst, uh, you know, on overdose calls as well as follow ups. Uh, and we try to track folks down wherever they are. And, and, uh, and that could be some really interesting places that they find themselves going to just try to find the individual that last presented uh, in an overdose situation. And we try to connect with them to find out um, if they um, how they're doing, but also to continue to find out if they are ready for treatment, at what level they'd like to get involved with, or just sometimes just giving them that support and letting them know that somebody is out there that's still um, that's still there to help them regardless of the overdose and whether or not they're ready for treatment today. Uh, it's a, a really uh, amazing program that. Uh, unfortunately has a lot of work uh, on a regular basis uh, to do. And they oftentimes are giving out Narcan or clean syringes as well, helping people find treatment and um, and help people to kind of also understand um, that they're, they are not alone. So it's uh, options is uh, uh, again, a, a really um, robust program that has been embraced very well by law enforcement. It took a long time, it's been about five years but it's taken a long time to get to the point where um, we're not just uh, a liaison that's sitting there waiting for something to happen in the police department. They're kind of, they're taking us along, and we're going out there um, and uh, and getting into um, you know where wherever we're trying to meet clients where they're at. Um, my other the other program uh, that we're part of that Tri County Mental Health is part of is called Project Support You. And that is a uh, boots on the ground kind of really unique ride along partnership. Uh, we have a, um, a partnership with Lewiston Police Departments where they go where they go out and together with an officer, they're um, working with people that are struggling and living with uh, substance misuse, 
homelessness, mental illness, and they're trying to get them help that they need. Uh, and in Auburn, uh, we just started a partnership, not only with the police department in Auburn, but also with fire department and EMS and uh, going. And so sometimes they're riding along in the ambulances with uh, someone struggling with mental health issue or substance abuse issue, issue and, uh, and either accompanying them to a treatment or to um, the hospital, uh, wherever that they need to go for to get some continuous help. Sometimes they're not ready for any of those steps and they just um, they meet our person on the streets because they literally do walk a beat just like some of the police officers and they go to the encampments uh, as well as um, the shelters and uh, you know um, I don't know a place that they haven't really gone and there are places that are you know that people probably don't even know that exist out here in Anderson County that they find themselves uh, but they um, they go out there to really try to help re you know reduce the overdose rates, help reduce the visits to the emergency rooms, um, and encourage family members, landlords, bystanders to contact um, you know Project Support You to help them, the people in need. So um, those are I'm glad that there are, will be um, contact information and slides and whatnot that you all can can see after the fact. Uh, and um, if you're interested in any of those programs, as contact information and numbers on there. But I would encourage you to even, you know, just kind of Google them and look that up. It's re some really amazing stuff that's happening right here in our county. Um, so a little kind of um, off, off uh, subject from what the resources are is really um, helping people to understand a little bit uh, that when we talk about addiction, addiction doesn't know any boundaries. It doesn't uh, favor any particular culture or gender or economic status um, or you know homeless status. Any it doesn't it doesn't really um, pick and choose uh, you know in special categories who it affects. And so you will oftentimes see uh, your either your clientele in an outpatient setting or inpatient setting that they're all walks of life that are coming in that are struggling with substance use. And obviously, it looks different between uh, someone using opiates versus someone using alcohol. But the uh, the trend is the same in terms of that it oftentimes is um, trauma based. And we're finding that probably more so today than ever that we can really kind of find the roots to, uh, you know, substance use addiction is generally starts with trauma. Um, and we just heard um, you know, from St. Mary's talking uh, quite extensively about their their work with trauma and how, uh, you know, how complex that is and that it's very different for everyone. So it's you oftentimes when you're working with someone with substance use, you don't you don't really know. Um, you don't necessarily know where it starts and where it's coming from or where it's going. And um, I think that as providers, I can say that, you know, early in the days, um, I've been in the field for 32 years and there was a long time ago that um, you just kind of, even though you were working with substance use um, affected individuals, that they, there was a tendency not to talk about it and not to ask and not to really kind of probe um, more into, um, you know, into their use and having conversations about it. Uh, obviously, over time, we found that uh, individuals want to be asked and providers sometimes get nervous about uh, asking those questions because then what do you do with the answer? And, um, you know, and that is the million dollar question oftentimes. What what do we do now that we have that information? So it is, um, it, it tends to be, um, you know, I, I don't know that there's a provider kind of um, profession that you wouldn't find someone who could probably openly say I'm uncomfortable with asking those questions. Um, one of the best things I think I've heard from a client over the years is uh, about that particular subject, about whether or not they would want to be asked about their substance use, is they said um, they recognize that people are uncomfortable about it because then they have to address it. And um, the client uh, remarked that uh, their uncomfortableness is, um, is not as hard as living with it. So it was they really wanted to be able to be asked. So they had a moment to be able to talk about it. And I think those are the conversations that um, my staff oftentimes will, you know, admit to say that um, sometimes I don't know if I want to go there. 
um, you know, what what happens, you know, when it runs away, when the information runs away with itself. And we encourage um, staff to really kind of step back for a moment and understand that um, clients, if they if they come through the door, if they take all the courage that they need to actually make it through the threshold and to come into your space to ask for help, then um, we kind of owe it to them to ask those questions. Um, they're, they're there, took a lot, of, a lot of guts for them. There's probably many times that they wanted to, um, you know, to make that phone call or to come into services and they couldn't get themselves there. Um, but if today is the day that they came into your space, then ask those questions because they're, they're wanting you to and they're ready. Oh, let me see. I have, there were some questions asked to me, so I, I want to make sure that I'm talking about them. Um, uh, well, uh, regarding culture, we are starting to see um, in the uh, Lewiston Auburn area, we are seeing an influx of um, from the new Manor community that are reaching out for services. And that's, um, it, it took a long time for us to really um, kind of probably ask ourselves why they weren't reaching out. And uh, Ed talked earlier about, you know, there's a lot of cultural differences that that we don't, sometimes we're stepping on and we don't know about um, that prevents them from coming into care or asking for help. And, um, but it's, uh, those are, that's a particular population as well that we can learn so much more from. And we can, I enjoy working with uh, the new Manor population because I feel like they teach us more than we, you know, we could probably teach them and they are teaching us how to help them. And those are like earlier when I was mentioning about just asking those questions. It's also another community that wants to be addressed and talked to and uh, and really um, wants us to understand them so they can also um, get well. So it's uh, it's I think it's we're we're kind of getting there where we're getting to a point where we're having uncomfortable conversations and we're talking about substance misuse in really every platform. Um, I've given a lot of these presentations to a lot of um, different providers and professions that really have nothing to do with the helping profession. They just won't really want to know on how they can be effective and helpful and supportive of people struggling with substance use. Uh, so I hope that answers some questions today. Um, um, I've got one that was here. Here we talked about earlier. The person's comment was around you know, emotional support versus mental support. And you talked about uh, the conversation really um, is a great way to breaking the stigma by just having the conversation. Does the conversation or the lead into the conversation change or vary drastically with cultures? Or is it kind of, do you start at the same point typically to have those conversations with most cultures? Um, well, I guess my, my typical answer to that is you meet a person where they're at, you know, um, what they want to talk about at that moment. Um, you can obviously do some lead in questions. There are sometimes providers kind of almost like a script a little bit about how do I say these things? What do I ask? How do I phrase it? Um, there are a lot of different um, kind of like assessment tools out there. We have our, our standard sort of DSM-5 criteria that we go by for diagnosis, but that doesn't help you sometimes. I don't know if anybody's read that, but uh, you know, it doesn't really provoke conversation. <laughs> so um, oftentimes um, like assessment tools like the CAGE, uh, or uh, the mast, those, or um, there's uh, a one that's a little bit more um, up to date, I think, uh, for today's um, cultural sensitivity is, um, it's called TAD, T-A-A-D, uh, I think it's triage assessment addictive diagnosis, something, I don't know what, what the last part is, I should know, um, but I don't, uh, but it's um, T-A-A-D, and um, so either the CAGE, the MAST, or, or TAD um, are really helpful sometimes, even if you just read them and get comfortable with what they're, what they're asking and sort of what helps a person to sort of either one, form a diagnosis, or two, just determine like, where should I go from here? Is this person truly struggling from substance use? Do I need to make a referral? Those are just the questions that are on there. 
um, I think they sort of invoke conversation and it opens opens that door um, for those um, you know, for those things to be discussed and, and whatnot. So, um, but I, that, I'm not sure that necessarily answers your question about um, is it one size fits all? I would say it's not. I uh, maybe do um, understand your audience a little bit and uh, in the sense of um, uh, meeting the person, you know, if they're whatever they're willing to come in and say to you and admit to you, start there. Yeah, and I think what you're saying also echoes what Tiffany and Edward just saying, and I'm sure what Scott will say to us in a minute. And what we've heard across our other three webinars is that it is so unique to the individual. In our religion one, a Catholic is not a Catholic. A Jewish person is not all Jewish people. A mental health diagnosis is not the same for every single person. But I think what you said, as simple as it is, is so incredibly profound of we just need to start having the conversations. And it's such a wonderful, easy, and simple step to not only break the stigma, but to help people get the help that they need. So I think it's really almost bringing it back to the basics of talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, talk to your patients, to your clients, and listen, really, truly listen. Two ears, one mouth, listen twice as much as you speak, right? That kind of thing. Okay, that's all I've got. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Ernestine. Um, what you're saying is incredibly impactful and I can, I'm sure everyone here can hear the passion and uh, what you're saying and how you're saying it. So um, great appreciation for the work you're doing. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Scott Hutcherson from the Lewison Vet Center. Welcome, Scott. Hi, thank you. Uh, Scott Hutcherson, I'm the director of the Lewiston Vet Center. Um, I was asked to come and talk about some of the unique features around working with veterans and the interface with mental health and uh, medical issues. Um, next slide. So the roots of, um, of the vet centers and the VA in general go way back. So like, for example, uh, Maine has the oldest uh, VA medical center in the country. It's over 150 years old. Um, the, uh, the vet centers were created in 1979 by an act of Congress by Vietnam veterans who wanted something separate and apart from the larger VAMC that was in their community that was more um, boots on the ground, more community based than a medical model. And that was the start of vet centers. Um, the mission statement of vet centers really comes from all the way back from the Gettysburg, uh, it, you know, talking about the president, you know, really helping those that are born the cost of battle and the mission statement really talks about that uh, really supporting and honoring those who served our country next slide um just a little bit about vet centers because some of you might not even know right in your neighborhood you have one uh there are vet centers all over the state of maine um all the way to caribou and down to sanford uh my vet center is in the lewiston area we we cover lewiston auburn um, and we provide all kinds of services. Originally, it started with just individual services for veterans who deployed to combat arenas or people who experienced military sexual trauma or harassment when they were in. Uh, it's expanded now because they realize that the impact on a veteran also ripples through and impacts the spouse, the family. Um, and so we actually do a lot of couples counseling at, at my vet center. We do some some family counseling. We even do bereavement counseling if someone uh, died on active duty. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is getting to some of the questions they asked. You know, can you describe what makes military a culture of its own? Um, so, for example. Right after World War II, President Truman desegregated the military. Uh, 20 years before uh, the whole movement by Martin Luther King to really um, move things in a positive way, the, uh, the military was kind of ahead of the game in some ways around that. But on the other side of it, 
you know, cultural sensitivity wasn't even a word back then. And this idea of um, when I was in the military, when I was in boot camp, I was told, you know, you all bleed green. What they meant by that was it doesn't matter where if you come from Puerto Rico or from Brooklyn or wherever you're from. We're all suffering together. We're all working together for a common cause and we're all equals um, in that mentality. So that was something that was unique to the military uh, way before, you know, regular society caught up to those concepts. Another common um, feature of any type of military, whether it's Air Force, Navy, even Coast Guard, is this idea of chain of command. Um, and this idea of following orders, even if you disagree with what they're saying. So if you're working in a company and you and and uh, and there's a debate over a topic, you could say, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to do that. Now, there may be some consequences for saying no. But in the military, there's this thing called the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So let's say um, you're out on liberty on the weekend and you do something stupid and you end up in jail and you have you have civilian charges you're dealing with. But you can't get out for a week. You come back to base to find out you now have been charged because you're uh, what's called AWOL, you know, absent without leave. So that you can experience charges on the civilian side and charges on the military side, which is uh, unique, like I said, to the military. Um, for example, infidelity um, is is actually in the UCMJ. Um, we may have ethical or moral issues around it in civilian life, but it's actually criminal under the UCMJ. So. Um, there is a strong culture in the military. One of the things that is is good about the military is that you feel like you're working on something greater than yourself. You're a part of something greater than yourself. Um, as I'll talk about in a little bit, sometimes that idealism can get disrupted uh, once you're in a combat arena and and uh, and things unfold that that can cause moral injury. Um, uh, you may get a person coming in uh, to your medical practice or your mental health practice that that you know uh, appears guarded. Well, that's because uh, unit cohesion is very important, and um, similar to I don't know if you've heard the term the thin blue line with the police department. It can get to a point where it's like us and everybody else. So you, you either in the military with us or you're an unknown and I don't know how much I, I, I uh, trust you. So trust is a is a real issue that can some can sometimes get in the way um, of, of treatment. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was around um, it, it is a culture in the sense that there's a lot of like jabbing, like, you know, you're a jarhead if you're a Marine, and then they call you back a squid if you're in the Navy, for example. There's a lot of, uh, if you've ever watched the Army Navy game, you know, there's a, it's huge competition, it's a big deal. Um, and um, there's a lot of acronyms. So again, you might have someone coming in and they're talking about, oh, my, you know, my MOS was 11 Bravo. It's OK to ask. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know what 11 Bravo is. Oh, that's an infantryman. You know, and understanding, uh, you know, what that role. So MOS is, you know, military ox occupational specialty, for example. There's lots of acronyms. Oh, I ETS in 2019. Well, separated from service. Um, so. You don't have to know all of those action ac acronyms. You don't even need to know all the structure, you know, from enlisted, which are E from E1 to, you know, E9 to O, which is officers. Um, and they have the same structure, but it's a, it, it really is a hierarchical environment where um, there are people who are non-commissioned officers. There are people who would be like a sergeant or a petty officer that are in charge of other enlisted people that are under an officer. 
like an 01, 02, you know, a second lieutenant or a first lieutenant or a captain. Um, when they're in that culture, they're exposed to all kinds of different stuff. So I kind of jokingly said, going to work can kill you. I mean, it's one of the few jobs that you do where you're putting your life on the line. You're raising your hand and you're doing the oath. Uh, and for X amount of years, you're tied to that, you're tied to that oath. And you're you don't know where you're going. You're you can request certain duty stations, but uh of the three duty stations I requested, I didn't get one. <laughs> um was sent to all kinds of very interesting places, but none that I had particularly decided I wanted to go to. And um, so, uh, let me see. So in that process, there's a hazardous duty. Uh, you actually get hazardous duty pay uh, for being in, in, in certain areas where you could get killed. Um, Many times you got young people idealistic, especially after September 11th. You had a whole bunch, I'm gonna go there. There was a football player who who actually gave up his, his professional career and went into the military, uh, who ended up dying from friendly fire tragically. But um, they can sometimes go in with a lot of energy, a lot of interest, um, feeling like they're, they're doing something larger than themselves, very mission focused. Um, and when they get out, like I'm, I'm, I'm working with a guy now who he didn't want to get out of the military, but when he was in Afghanistan, uh, he was exposed to an a improvised explosive, you know, IED that caused him a severe, uh, uh, you know, head trauma that it took a long time for him to heal from. And he, he, uh, he saw himself as career military and all of a sudden. He had doctors saying, you're a liability to your unit. We're going to have to separate you from service. And how that impacted him was tremendous. Uh, he was lost. Uh, talking about alcohol use, he escaped by psychologically numbing, by drinking. So then he went from having one problem to having two problems. You know, uh, two divorces later, he comes into my office now. Uh, you know, and the, the P in post-traumatic stress, you know, is uh, many times there is denial. Uh, could you go to the next slide? Um, and um, I, I thought it was the slide after. It's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll change gears. So um, talking about strong unit cohesion, um, when I was getting out, they were just starting to integrate uh, the military where they were male and female in units together. And um, but even back then, there were issues around uh, military sexual trauma and the rupture that that causes. You know, uh, you know, I have your back, you have my back. I'm supposed to trust you. And then something horrible happens. It's even worse when you go to command and they they put it under the rug and they don't deal with it uh i had one case to the point where uh, a guy put a gun to her head and other people saw it and then finally uh he just was whisked away into another unit but he was not arrested he was not charged with with anything um very i'm i'd like to believe that things have changed. I know that in 2018, some laws within the military were changed um, to make it uh, more protect, protective of people. But uh, we see a lot of people at the vet center and you're gonna see people walking into your practice that, that have suffered military sexual trauma. And it can come out in all kinds of ways. A big thing we're seeing is a lot of gastrointestinal problems. You're having somatic symptoms attached to a psychological issue. Um, I had a woman I've been doing EMDR with who experienced military sexual trauma for 30 years. You know, when she got out of the military, she was an EMT. Uh, she she drank, which was problematic, but um, led to other problems. Ended up leading to a divorce. Um, but she always had this horrible gastrointestinal problem and this very bad uh, tension in her stomach. 
And by doing EMDR, we were able to identify what was going on there, that it was totally trauma based. And we were able to kind of clear that out. And in one session, she was like, it's gone. It's gone. You know, uh, the, 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 the tension in her stomach had dissipated. Um, so being able to understand the anxiety, the nervous behavior, you know, the somatic symptoms you're seeing might be attached to um, military related traumatic experiences. Um, this idea of, uh, of disillusionment is not just with MST. Uh, you've got other people who you're trying to do the right thing. You go to Iraq, you know, but then there's a 13 year old kid who picks up a weapon and you have to you have to shoot that that kid in order to protect yourself and your unit. But you just killed a 13 year old kid. How do you wrap that around your head? You know, um, your uh, officers may be making decisions you don't agree with, but you're forced to follow through unless you feel it's an unlawful order. In other words, it's breaching the UCMJ. Unless it's an unlawful order, you are required to follow that order. And um, I've had lots of veterans who really felt command screwed up and end up causing the death of friends of theirs. So disillusionment is, is a real thing. And I wanted to touch to uh, you know, a large percentage of, of people who leave the military actually go into law enforcement or you know, uh, becoming firefighters. So you may have someone coming in and they're actually coming in talking about an experience when they were a firefighter, but that just is magnified by stuff that happened when they served in the military that they just stuffed and they didn't deal with. Uh, there was a slide that I had some narrative on. Uh, we may, have, it may be the next slide. Could you go to the next slide? Let me see. Yeah, on this slide, there's a whole bunch of statements here. Suck it up, press forward. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The only easy day was yesterday. This whole up-tempo mission thing of repeated deployments, you know, you're slugging a 60 pound pack on your back, you're, you're, you're fast roping down, you're jumping out of helicopters, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really, really hard on the body, but it also is a mentality of not showing any weakness because it could be threatening to the survival of themselves or the unit. So they stuff it. They stuff it, stuff it, stuff it. Um, and then when they get out of the military, it slowly starts to leak out in, in, in negative ways, impacting their relationships, their work. We talked about drinking, starting to drink more and more. Um, a unique thing since 2001 is uh, this idea of improvised explosive devices where you know, in Vietnam, there were events that happened where there were IEDs, but nothing like these, uh, it, it, those two wars. Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, uh, devastating, devastating IEDs um, that um, have concussive blasts. So you may even ask somebody, you know, have you ever been exposed to like a, you know, a concussive event or whatever, an IED blast? And they're like, I oh, no, no. And it turns out they got like one guy, he got blown out of a turret, you know, and, but he just got his bell rung. That's all, you know, but he got up and was able to return fire. So he's fine. Well, he actually had a TBI and it was untreated and it was undiscovered for a long time and it was causing all kinds of other problems like impulsivity for example um and uh you know since 2001 to 2018 there's been a sharp increase in veteran and active duty suicides i don't know if you're aware but combat veterans have up to a five times greater chance of committing suicide than civilians and female veterans have up to a six times higher chance of committing suicide than their civilian counterparts. So um, that's something to really take take serious. Um, and we really do a lot of assessing on that when when somebody comes into our office. Uh, next slide. Hey Scott, can I ask a question yeah. first? Sure. On the last slide you were 
about physical and psychological um, health things not being reported until folks are out of the military. They kind of unravel as they discharge and whatnot. Um, what are the impacts of the delayed health effects when it comes to being able to access benefits? And I guess the question is more around like timeliness of reporting these things. Does this impact their ability to get care through the military? And if so, how? Okay, so uh, that's a good, that's a big question, but it's a good question. So, um, so I'm Johnny Soldier. Soldier, I was jumping out of the heel. I really messed up my knee, but I'm, I'm, you know, we need to press forward. So we keep going. I don't even go to the to to the infirmary to get it checked out. I just suck it up, you know, and uh, and I try to bandage it up myself so that I can still stay in the fight and I can do what I got need to do. Um, so there's no record of that injury. Now you get out and it's 10 years later and you go, damn, my knees are killing me, you know? And I know it's directly related to my military experience, but now I've got 10 more years on my body and it's really feeling it now where I was able to get away with it when I was younger. Well, now it becomes a real problem of kind of showing you have to prove the connectedness to what occurred in the military that it that it resulted. Now, there is some, uh, as part of uh, separating, there's a whole orientation process and they do have to get, you know, a medical evaluation, hearing, all this other stuff. As as trying to get the baseline when they leave the military, um, but um, it, it's not uncommon for people to talk about, you know, loss of hearing or back problems or knee problems or, well, um, we may have blown past the slide uh, talking about hazardous duty there, but, um, you know, being exposed to burn pits, for example, you know, uh, people were coming back from the Persian Gulf War in the 90s talking about, and they called it Gulf War Syndrome. Well, they're now realizing that that's probably connected to sarin gas exposure, you know, uh, they've actually recently found a potential link to that. You know, uh, they just passed the PACT Act talking about exposure to burn pits and how that can impact your health. Um, during, you know, during the Vietnam War, Agent Orange as a defoliant was sprayed all over the place. You know, well, it turns out there are, there are all these what are called presumptive disorders that are attached to exposure to Agent Orange. Um, particularly veterans coming back from Vietnam were not treated very well. And it was really hard, you know, it was decades before they actually would go back to the VA or even think about filing a claim. There's um, there's all these what are called VSOs. A great VSO here in Maine is, you know, uh, Maine Bureau of Veteran Services. At my vet center right down the hall, we actually opened up a space so that they could have a VSO there. So we literally walk them down so they can meet with that person. They could go over what the issues are, help them advocate for uh, doing what's called a comp and pen evaluation. So they can they can look at getting what's called a rating um, for a medical issue. And there, there's the rating has two pieces. One is a medical rating. So like, for example, you could get a rating that says 0% service connected. And you're like, well, what the hell does that mean? It means they recognize there's a problem with my hearing, but they're not saying it's impaired me enough to get reimbursement financially. So there's VBA, the veteran benefits part, and VHA, the medical part. So when they're doing a comp and pen evaluation, they're assessing, you know, was some event occurred that in the military that now there's ripple effects of that they're eligible for medical services at the vet center. I mean, at the at the VA uh, medical center. On the other side, they may also be eligible for service connected disability. So when I was in, a friend of mine was in Grenada. He was part of the 82nd Airborne, and then he was jumping in Panama. He he jumped and hit uneven ground, and he his leg snapped, and it was in an L shape. It was, you know, and he ended up having all these pins in his leg. He ended up having to separate from service. Didn't want to, 
but he got an honorable discharge due to medical issues. Um, and uh, I used to drive him up to Togus and he had to have an evaluation and he got like 30%, he got like a 30% medical rating um, where he'd get a certain amount of money each month for that injury, if that makes sense. I, I don't want to go too down that rabbit hole, but um, it, it, um, it sometimes can be difficult for people to kind of prove that I'm saying this injury heard, but there's there's no evidence in their medical record while they're in the military. Um, because of that culture of I've got, you know, I've got to be mission ready. I got to keep going. We got to go back out in the field tomorrow. I can't afford to be hurt. Um, and so as a result, someone might have had a, a, a MTBI, a milder TBI, or some injury like some torn this or hurt that and they just suck it up and there's no medical record supporting that so um so why don't we um so uh the next question is in, in what ways can civilian health care providers uh, provide more inclusive health care to veterans um I'm actually on a committee. Uh, it's called the Governor's Challenge. It is a joint uh, effort between the Veterans Administration and SAMHSA to really look at reducing uh, veteran service member um, and family uh, suicides to try to reduce the suicide rate. And um, we're just going into the implementation phase and we're actually going to be working with eventually um, PCP offices. Uh, we're going to start with like kind of quick care, convenient MD like locations. Um, uh, you know, uh, even within the ER around being able to ask the question or have you or someone in your family served in the military? And if so, being able to kind of ask a series of questions around safety. Um, there's a tool called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, which you can look that up and it's it, it it's actually a self-faced tutorial. It's a very easy tool to use, but it's it's been, you know, evidence based, uh, you know, has good validity as a tool. And um, our, our efforts eventually over the next couple of years is to roll that out, those two pieces around asking the question, um, and uh, if indeed they are a service member and there is any uh, indication that there's any uh, health concern, uh, mental health concern to pull out the, the Columbia and to be able to do that. Uh, and then the next phase, uh, we're looking actually at a toolkit for providers. So if the answer is yes, what do I do? Well, being able to help explain what what, what we can do, what they can do. Um, the other thing is being in in network as a community provider uh, to our veterans. Uh, so they've expanded services. So especially if it's a specialty thing, they need to have podiatry or this and that. They can be seen now in the community and the VAMC will pay for that service. Well, they're expanding it so that uh, if preference of the veteran is they want to see a provider at St. Mary's or whatever that if you're part of that network piece, um, even though they're not, you know, the VAMC is not an insurance company, they kind of work to make sure that the, the medical center or uh, the provider is able to get paid for that service for that veteran. Um, and then uh, obviously some of what we're doing right now is that training on military culture, understanding military rank, understanding military jargon, um, understanding you've got somebody coming in and they're acting a certain way and you're like, why are they doing that? Well, it, it may very well be because of the experiences they had when they were in country. And um, uh, one, a friend of mine describes it like for Iraq, uh, she used to say, you know, they have one foot in the sandbox and they have one foot at home. So they haven't fully integrated or readjusted, you know, uh, to to being fully home and the impact of that. So an example of that uh, female client uh, that I worked with uh, had multiple firefights in the situation, IED blasts and everything. And 
she came home and was talking to me. What brought her in is she was going to school. Like uh, the the GI Bill is great. If you serve in the military, you're able to go to school and the, and, and the government helps pay for that. So she was in school. And uh, she was getting majorly triggered by people in the class and an event happened. So she came in to see me and what she said was, if you're over there and there's a loud noise and you grab the person next to him and you throw him to the ground, that's a good thing. Here at home, not so much. <laughs> you know, so she had had a triggering event, you know, and, and she screamed and grabbed the person and threw him to the ground and they're looking at her like, what the hell's going on? Someone just slammed their locker really loud. But for her, she had one foot still in the sandbox, you know, uh, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, next slide. So um, this next question, uh, what are three statewide healthcare resources programs available uh, to veterans? So just like there are vet centers throughout the country, which I, at the end I have a slide of all of them, you know, there, uh, back when my friend was injured, like it was 1982, back when he was injured, there was just Togus. We had to drive from Saco all the way to Togus for him to get treatment. Um, about 15 years ago, things started to change and they said, well, that's, you know, we need to look at services closer to the community where the people live. So they started creating these things called community-based outpatient clinics. So there's a six million dollar one that was just made, just built a year ago. That's right here in Portland. You know, um, there's uh, a new one that's going to be opening in June in Rumford, uh, for example. There are community-based clinics like from Caribou, Bangor. Uh, it, there's one in Lewiston that's about five minutes from from our vet center. Um, there's also been a bigger push to really support women veterans. There actually is a women veterans program uh, at Togus. Uh, I got the phone number on the slide there. Um, and then we we are very rich uh, in in resources here in Maine. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but like uh, Maine is like it hovers between like the second and third highest combat veterans per capita in the country. So we have a lot of veterans in Maine. Um, and um, as a result, there's several things like the House in the Woods that was created, uh, Veterans Adapted Sports Program, VAST, uh, over at Pineland. Um, they do everything from archery to like being in recumbent bikes to going hiking, uh, they, helping the kind of rehab counseling piece getting people out in nature, which is really cool. Travis Mills Foundation, uh, they just had the uh, the airplane pull thing a couple of months ago to help support Travis Mills. Um, he's a very gregarious person, I don't know if you know him, but he, 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 he served multiple tours, his last tour in Afghanistan. Uh, he lost both his legs and uh, parts of both of his arms. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, he's, he's not lost his personality, his sense of humor, and he, his mission is to help other veterans. So he has a location called the Travis Mills Foundation, where he brings veterans to just chill out, go, uh, kayaking, go, you know, hiking, whatever, whatever helps you relax. Um, uh, and it's no cost to the veteran. So to the point of homeless veterans right here in Lewiston, um, there's Vets Inc, which is a program that allows a homeless veteran to stay up to a year um, at their location on Main Street as they work with them to help them look at employment, look at a, a, a stable housing options. Um, so I think we're very fortunate here, here, in, uh, here in Maine for the, the number of services uh, that we have. Um, that, that picture down the bottom there is what's called a mobile vet center. Uh, my vet center in Lewiston has the only mobile vet center in, in, uh, in the state of Maine. Um, so my MVC driver, Jerry, he travels all over. If you go to 
anything from like, you know, the sportsman show or whatever, you'll probably see Jerry with his MVC with a table trying to reach out to veterans. Um, so I think that's the last slide or one more. I think there's one more. I think that might be the, yeah. So this is just a picture to indicate, um, you know, since 1979, incrementally, there's been more and more and more vet centers that have opened based on the needs of where our veterans are and what in what they need. So uh, we have vet centers in Puerto Rico, American Samoa. We have vet centers all over all over the country um, to try to make it easy for veterans to access mental health counseling. So my vet center really functions as a kind of a trauma center. Um, like I said, we do readjustment counseling with people coming back from combat arenas. Um, if if someone died on active duty, we've we've worked with the parents of someone who died on active duty. We've worked with the wife and children of someone who died on active duty, for example. Um, so we do bereavement counseling. The majority of what we do is uh, individual and we have lots of different groups. Uh, we're fortunate at the vet center that we do all kinds of interesting things like we're doing guitar for vets where we're training vets how to play guitars. And once we have a big enough cohort, they can actually jam together at the vet center. Um, we have an art group that we offer. Uh, we've done a women's hiking group. Um, we have uh, different groups depending on what era they served in. Uh, Prior to the the uh, COVID, the pandemic, we actually had a World War II Korean group that had about five vets that came to it, but you know, unfortunately, uh, COVID kind of destroyed that. But uh, we have mixed era groups. Um, we do all kinds of creative things. We try to have it a very low barrier environment, um, so it's welcoming when they when they come into the vet center. Um, uh, I think there's one more slide that kind of just talks about some resources. Um, so I don't know if you're aware, but there was a, a thing that just came out a couple of months ago. It's called 988. The 9889 option one is specifically for veterans. So uh, just like, you know, calling 911 or, or bat, you know, bat, the 211, 988 was a shortened because the the you know well you can see what the old number is it's a very long number um 988 is easy to remember they're actually going to be in the next year uh, handing out lots of magnets and flyers and stuff for people to be aware but 24 7 that's man so uh veterans very commonly have sleep problems. Insomnia is not common for veterans and it might be two in the morning and they're having some you know, disturbing thoughts, or they may have just woken up from really bad nightmare, they could call 988 and hit option one, and they'll they'll speak to the combat call center around uh, what they're dealing with, which is usually manned with veterans, actually. So uh, I guess uh, that was a lot to throw at you in a very short period of time. So I uh, maybe I'll open it up for questions if there's any questions in the Q&A. I think we've got them all so far. Okay, great, thank you. That was some fantastic information you just provided, uh, Scott. Thank you so much. So if there's no more questions, we just really thank you for all attending today. Um, a recording of today's webinar will be sent to all of you. Um, we would greatly appreciate you taking a three minute three minutes to complete the webinar evaluation. We appreciate your feedback and it helps us to fulfill our grant commitments and secure future funding. And the